Ma'am, can you tell us the weightage? What will be the weightage for like assignments and quizzes? I did send an email, no? Uh, so I think, uh, let me pull it out. I didn't remember exactly. Uh, uh, so I think around 10% uh, for uh, quizzes. Uh, sorry, uh, let me just pull it out. Give me a minute. Huh? Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Log into Moodle. So there was this, yeah, evaluation scheme. Uh, did you get this email? So this said 10% for uh, uh, best five scores out of seven assignments, two quizzes, uh, most probably 20%, 30% weightage for the mid-semester exam, and 40% for the end-semester examination. You all got this email, right? Ma'am, um, I didn't get this. I don't know why, but it might be in Moodle. OK, how about other students? Did you all get this email or you did not? Yes, ma'am, I got it. Oh, you got it. Okay, yes, ma'am. OK, all right, yeah. Uh, so, Aman, does that clarify your uh, doubt? Uh, yes, ma'am. OK, uh, anything else? Uh, ma'am, I have one more doubt. Like you explained um, the IVP, con uh, IVP for continuous functions and there was sure. IVP for derivatives. So, yes. ma'am, I did not like get the exact difference like why doesn't it follow ah, so let me just open that huh? give me a minute let me open the example huh? see the point is uh, that uh, so let me just open that right huh? so do you see uh, journal now do you see uh, uh, some things that i have uh, scribbled at your end this is the thing that you are asking about right yes ma'am okay See, the point here is one cannot apply the intermediate value property for the continuous function because what is that we know in theorem one? The function f is differentiable. That implies only that the function, you would like the intermediate value property. You would like the, so in order to appeal to the intermediate value property of continuous function to prove theorem one, that is the intermediate value property of derivatives, you need the information that the derivative of f is a continuous function. Is that uh, correct, Aman? Why is, oh, okay, okay. So yeah, like f, f is differentiable, so f dash is common, but I cannot see. But you cannot uh, say, see, what is that we know is f is differentiable, that implies f is continuous. And it implies that the derivative of f, f prime exists, but we do not know a priori if the derivative of f is continuous. And you know, and we saw an example. This is very well possible that f is differentiable, which means that the derivative exists everywhere, but the derivative need not be continuous. So you need a separate proof of this, and you cannot appeal to the intermediate value property for continuous functions here. Yeah, so for your benefit, the intermediate value property of continuous function is right here. Uh, so, you know, in order to apply this intermediate value property for continuous function to prove theorem one, you need you need to apply uh, th uh, sorry, this intermediate value property to the function g equal to the derivative of f. So you need the information that the derivative of f is continuous, which may not be the case. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I so the strength of this theorem is, uh, uh, Aman, that, you know, without assuming the fact that the derivative of f is a continuous function, the derivative of f in general need not be a continuous function as in the assumptions of theorem 1. However, the intermediate value property for derivatives still holds. Yeah, this is why this theorem is striking. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Excellent. Uh, somebody has some, uh, some other concerns, questions? Ma'am? Yes, please. Ma'am, for the practice problems that you have given, like yes. uh, 
Could you give some hint for sum number five? Uh, let me just uh, pull that out. Huh? Give me a minute. Uh, so we are on Moodle. Uh, Question number five. <clears throat> okay, uh, so let's see. Uh, so let A0, A1, AN be real numbers satisfying a, a certain equation. Yeah, A0 plus A1 by 2 all the way plus a n minus 1 plus a n by a n plus 1 by n plus 1 is 0. Prove that the equation has a real root in the interval 0, 1. Yeah. So let me uh, write down this somewhere. Uh, give me a minute. Huh? So, uh, sorry. So I think this is uh, tutorial 13 today. Question five, is it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, practice uh, problem uh, set two, right? Uh, so uh, given, uh, so let's just recall the problem. Uh, A0, A1 up to An such that uh, A0 plus uh, let me just recall the exact identity that is written here a1 by 2 yeah uh, uh, a1 by 2 plus a n minus 1 by n minus 1 i think it is uh, oh by n by n and uh, a n by n plus 1 equals 0. Uh, uh, we are required to show that uh, this equation uh, even x Has a real root. Uh, sorry, I. Uh, this is x to the power. Uh, just a minute. Huh? A n to the one to the power uh, x n minus one and a n to the power x n. Yeah. So I I I did not write this properly. This. Uh, yeah. So now I think we are okay. Uh, this uh, has a real root in the interval. problems like this is to realize you know uh, uh, what is the relevant theorem that we need to apply here yeah that's the first thing so uh, does something come to your mind when you see a problem like this yes ma'am uh, yeah ma'am uh, we can apply rolls theorem here so one way to go about it, thank you so much, is to apply the Rolle's theorem, right? So what is that you do? You define an appropriate function. Uh, yes, so why do you define? So let me define f as a0 plus a1x plus a n minus 1 x to the power n minus 1 plus uh, a n x to the power n. Shall I define something like this? Uh, Ma'am, uh, we can define a function uh, which comes by integrating this function. Right. 
so we should define a function so uh, kritika here is what we do yeah so the first thing is to realize that you need to uh, consider apply the rolls theorem here yeah remember what is rolls theorem rolls theorem says something of the following effect right let f be uh, so let me just pull that out uh, let f be differentiable on the open interval ab and f is continuous on closed interval ab um f of a equals to uh, the uh, value f takes at b which means f of b and then uh, the theorem says something about uh, the derivative of f vanishing at a point between a and b yeah so let me just pull out uh, the statement here it is uh, so do you see rolls theorem at your end <clears throat> yes ma'am yes so we will use this result uh, to show that uh, that uh, fun, you know uh, you have given us some polynomial equation right and you have to show that that polynomial equation has uh, uh, has a real root right so the conclusion of the rolls theorem says that the derivative of f has a root you know one way of looking at it is that the derivative of f has a root in the interval ab correct yes ma'am yes so an a here is 0 in the question and b is 1 right so uh, what <clears throat> so i i sort of uh, could not make out from the voice uh, who was the student who was trying to uh, sort of help us around uh, uh, so i don't know uh, was it uh, sanjeev is he around i don't know so some uh, some friend of yours as he was suggesting that uh, <clears throat> let's integrate it so why is this suggestion of integration coming in let's see uh, uh, so let me scroll back to where i was writing uh, here yeah um, yeah so in order to apply uh, the rolls theorem to uh, to uh, to solve this problem what do we do to do we need to look for a function f such that the derivative of uh, f is given as follows right because the conclusion of the rolls theorem says that the derivative of f is going to vanish at some point in the interval 0 1 right so if the derivative of f looks like this then uh, so i would say hint apply rolls theorem to an appropriate function to f such that like this so what should y n plus one is that correct, Katka? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Yeah. So first thing is you have to think of a function uh, function like this, and now you know uh, you know this is another polynomial, right? So there is no problem in saying that f is you know differentiable in open interval zero one, f is continuous in closed interval zero one. What is it you need to check in order to apply the rolls theorem? Yeah. So what happens at zero? What happens to this function at zero? At zero, it is uh, uh, zero, correct? And what happens to this function at one? At one, uh, uh, the function is given to be zero by assumption. You know, a zero, a one, a n by hypothesis are uh, real numbers satisfying a certain equation. Yeah. So let me call this equation as star. So. Uh, So this is f of one is zero by star. Right. So uh, by Rolle's theorem, uh, uh, there exists a point C in open interval zero one such that the derivative of f vanishes at that point. Yeah, so which is exactly what is required. Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, excellent. Yeah, see, all uh, so sort of all one has to do here is uh, 
sort of the trick here is to realize what is the appropriate result that we have to apply here. Uh, once you sort of uh, once it occurs to you that you know Rose theorem is what is being used, uh, then uh, thinking of the function appropriate function f is not difficult. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. What else? Any other question? Concern? Somebody wants to say something. Okay, ask something. Ma'am. Yes, please. Ma'am, uh, I have a doubt. Uh, mm. In the uh, in one of the questions in the quiz one, I have uh, done a mistake, but I uh, don't understand it. Uh, what I have done wrong. So Niladri, I did send you an email. Did you check your email? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ah, so that doesn't I, I, um, settle it. Okay. All right. Tell me. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that, uh, that is that is uh, a solution, but um, that ah, so I you want to discuss actually. your solution of question yeah, number yeah. four? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. See, Niladri, I really don't understand. Uh, uh, see, how are you picking those uh, the points of the subsequence? How are you picking x n one, x n two? How are you picking that r one, r two, r three? See, unless uh, meaning, you know, you can't pick some random points from a sequence and get a subsequence, right? Uh, subsequence has to satisfy this, right? Uh, so if you want, so given a sequence, this is just a clarification, right? Uh, given a sequence x n, uh, sequence of this This is by definition of a subsequent. Uh, no, NK is a sequence of positive integers, and this needs to be strictly increasing. Yeah, which means that uh, you know um, N1 is strictly less than N2 is strictly less than N3. Uh, so, you know, when you are picking those points, this needs to be taken care of very, very carefully. That is one. And two, you know, there are two things that we need to do in that question. One, XNK has to be a subsequence of XN, which means that NK needs to be strictly increasing. And two, we need XNK to converge. So you need to construct a convergent subsequence. Only then, you know, you can say that, you know, by hypothesis, XNK would converge to X0. Is that correct, Niladri? Uh, do you get my point? Yes, ma'am. Uh, huh. I I mentioned that the uh, mm, that the indices that n one n two are increasing, and I chose those points. But you know, uh, see, as far as I remember, you know, you are saying you know. Now, how are these ri's chosen? I don't know. 
and why can you choose an increasing strictly increasing sequence why, meaning how can you choose a subsequence in in order to say that x and k converges right uh, you you need uh, you know some more information about these ris your ris are some random real numbers so if you are still not confused uh, still not convinced by my say, i mean uh, what i am trying to say niladri so if you have time then maybe at 9:30 i can take up your solution uh, individually uh, you know uh, i sort of want to give each one of you some dignity i don't want to share your uh, sort of solution and answer script here on a public forum where all your friends can see it that's the only thing uh, so is that okay niladri Yes, you know, you may want to share it with your friends, but I, as an instructor, would like to you know talk to uh, the students on one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, so you know, at uh, nine, sorry, at nine thirty, if you are available, did I say eight thirty? Sorry, uh, at nine thirty, if you are available, then I can sort of uh, we can spend some more time, and uh, you know, either way, either you convince me or I will try to convince you. Is that okay? Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay, yeah? Ma yeah, just yeah, you know, just be there at nine thirty. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, you welcome. Anything else? Okay. Uh, you now, if you don't have anything to say, uh, you know, some time back uh, we introduced the concept of uniform continuity. Um, and uh, so, is that okay with everybody? Do you all understand what is the uh, difference in uh, a continuous function and a uniformly continuous function? Very well. Uh, is that all okay? Yes, ma'am. OK, all right. Uh, so then I need not illustrate it uh, here by an example. Were you able to attempt uh, the problems on uniform continuity uh, in the assignment sheets? I think both the assignments six and seven had a problem each on uniform continuity. Continuous and a function which is uh, not uniformly continuous. So if you sort of are comfortable, then I needn't talk about it here. Is that all OK? Ma'am, if you could solve some examples, it would be better. So OK. Uh, see, meaning I sort of want to uh, illustrate uh, what is the difference between the two. Uh, you know, uh, what is the difference between uh, saying that uh, uh, f is continuous and f is uh, uh, uniformly continuous. You know, we, we saw something, right? In one case, uh, the delta that you get depends only on uh, the point, uh, and the other case, uh, sorry, it possibly can depend on the point and epsilon, and the other case, when the function is uniformly continuous, it only depends on epsilon. So uh, let me sort of uh, write down something here. Uh, uh, so when you prove that a function is continuous on a set E, let's say. Uh, uh, so, so let's see if you agree with what I'm writing. Uh, so when you prove uh, uh, that if so some function is continuous, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm taking a function uh, on some set E. Uh, let's say in a subset of a real line and f is real valued yeah then what do you do uh, this is the way we do things right so uh, you fix a point uh, x naught in e yeah Con f is continuous on e if f is continuous at each point of e and then you fix an epsilon right and then you say that there exists 
a delta uh, which depends on possibly both x naught and epsilon such that uh, for all the points of E, uh, um, whenever uh, x is in delta neighborhood of x naught, uh, it follows that f of x is in epsilon neighborhood of uh, uh, f of x naught, right? Um, so over here, you know, uh, the expression for delta can involve both x naught and epsilon, but must be independent of the involve x. Yeah, does everybody follow this bit? I'll repeat again, x has not yet been chosen at the point where delta is defined. So the definition of delta must not involve x. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, so, ma'am. Yeah, the only thing that I'm trying to emphasize is here. The only difference between the two definitions, one of continuity and the other of uh, uniform continuity, is the order of quantifiers. Yeah, so I, I'll, uh, I'll sort of tell you what I'm trying to say. So when you prove that a function is uniformly continuous, uh, so I'll, I'll write it down. When you prove uh, that f is uniformly continuous on the same set E, here's what you do. Uh, you know, you fix epsilon first. Yeah. Over continuity, you fix the point x naught first, and then you say that then there exists delta depending on epsilon such that for every point x naught in uh, in the set E. And x, uh, and for every point x in the set E, uh, whenever x is in delta neighborhood of x naught, it would follow that f of x is in epsilon neighborhood of f of x naught. So, you know, the expression for delta can only involve epsilon and must not involve either x or x naught. Is that okay? I'll give you an example, but for, so far, does it make sense to everybody? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Ma yeah, so let, let's see an example. Um, uh, so let's see an example to sort of emphasize this fact, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, let's, let's look at, you know, to sort of, uh, bring out the contrast, let's look at example of a function which is continuous on a set E, but not uniformly continuous on a set E. Yeah, um, so let's see. So I say that fx equal to x square, uh, this is just one example to highlight uh, what is happening, is continuous on the interval 0 to infinity, but not uniformly continuous. on this set. Uh, so let's see. Uh, let's prove uh, the fact that f is continuous on uh, uh, the positive real axis first. Right? Let's do that. Yeah. So um, so here is what we have to do. Um, so in order to show that f is continuous on the interval 0 to infinity, what do you do? You fix a point x0 in the interval 0 to infinity, show that f is continuous there at the point x0. 
and then claim that you know x not is any arbitrary point that would imply that f is continuous everywhere right so uh, you know so let's just write down what is that we need to do yeah so i'm to show that f is continuous uh, on the interval 0 to infinity um, we prove the following statement And for all epsilon positive, uh, there exists a delta such that for every x in E with the property uh, that x is in delta neighborhood of the point x naught, it should follow that f of x is in epsilon neighborhood of f of x naught. Is that okay with everybody so far? Ma'am, you are showing to show that f is uniformly continuous, right? Not no, continuous. no, I am showing f is continuous here. But ma'am, you have uh, taken like for all x naught belonging to 0 to infinity, you have not fixed your point. Yeah, Why yeah. So this is true for each x naught, right? I want to show that for f is continuous at each x naught, and that would imply that f is continuous everywhere on the interval zero to infinity. Yeah. So my x naught is arbitrary right now. You fix any x naught, and then you have to show this that for every x naught, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so let's uh, analyze what is the difference f of x minus f of x naught, right? Uh, So by the definition of the function, this is x square minus x naught square. This is x minus x naught, uh, x plus x naught, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, if x comes within delta neighborhood of x naught, then the difference x minus x naught is uh, at most delta. So, what is it we want to show? We want to show that we want to pick a delta such that whenever x is in uh, delta neighborhood of x naught, then f of x should land in epsilon neighborhood of f of x naught. Yeah. So, what is that we want? We want uh, this quantity on the right to be less than, you know, I'm just thinking aloud here, uh, a prescribed epsilon, right? So, over here, um, the first term, you know, this is this term. Uh, x minus x naught, this is less than delta. There's no problem here, right? What is that you want? You want that for all x in delta neighborhood of x naught, you need a bound on x plus x naught. Is that correct? Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So how do we choose delta? Can somebody guide me? This is plain, simple continuity. How do we go about choosing delta? And we can choose delta less than x naught by 2. Okay, so here's a suggestion. Yeah, let me just uh, follow Kritika's approach. Uh, so let's see if works, if it works. So Kritika says that you can make delta as small as possible. So let's choose delta less than x naught by 2. Okay, so then what happens is then... Uh, x minus x naught uh, is less than than 4. x minus x naught less than delta, which is less than x naught by choose by choice. It will follow that uh, x is less than uh, x naught plus x naught by 2, uh, which is equal to uh, 3x naught by 2. Is that correct, Ritika? This is what you want to yes, say? Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, so uh, so the suggestion is, so then uh, you can say that, uh, so you know this is all uh, sort of scribbling the way
values are written So this is uh, sorry. This is mod of x minus x naught times mod of x plus x naught. Now all of it is positive. Uh, so uh, so then uh, whenever x is in delta neighborhood of x naught. Uh, Um, so the first uh, thing in the brackets here, uh, so I'll just write it as it is, x minus x naught. And the second thing, I can forget about the absolute values because everything is positive. Now, this is less than delta by choice. And the second thing would be less than uh, x is at most 3x naught by 2 plus x naught. Is that correct? And what is this? This is delta times uh, 5x naught by 2. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, less than epsilon, provided what happens? When is this less than epsilon? You know, x naught we have no control over. x naught is something which is fixed. Yeah. Provided delta satisfies this inequality, that delta is uh, bounded by. 5, 2 times uh, epsilon by 5x naught. Is that correct? And we can do that because x naught is strictly positive. Yeah. So end of it, if I have to sort of summarize all of this, then how should I write down the solution? What should be my choice of delta in this, uh, the way uh, Kritika has suggested? What should be my choice of delta? The minimum of... Uh x naught by 2 and 2 epsilon by 5 x naught. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so I should write down the final solution should be written like this. Yeah, uh, uh, that uh, choose delta to be uh, the minimum. Uh, sorry, I did not write this properly. Uh, the minimum of uh, So I I want uh, so what is it uh, x naught by two sorry I want delta to satisfy both these inequalities simultaneously so one way to ensure that is to x delta to be the minimum of these two numbers yeah x naught by two and two epsilon by five x naught yeah then uh, uh, f of x uh, lives in the prescribed epsilon neighborhood of f of x naught whenever uh, x comes from the delta neighborhood of x naught. Is that correct? Is everybody with me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So, you know, this is just one way to do this. As I would reiterate, delta is not unique. You can choose something else and, uh, you know, it might work. Ma'am? Yes, please. Ma'am, if we are writing it in the exam, so hmm. only then the how? blue part should be written, right? Uh, well, not. Uh, so, the blue part with little additional details. Uh, so, I'll, I'll just say that. Uh, so, uh, maybe if you want me to sort of so it's not about writing an exam it's about sort of how do you write mathematical proofs yeah so in that case then you say that then uh, f of x minus f of x naught so you should write in this manner uh, is uh, equal to x square minus x naught square is uh, x minus x naught x plus x naught right um, you know, this is the way a mathematical proofs should be written. Um, uh, you know, if you read any standard text in uh, real analysis, uh, you would get an idea as to how proofs are written. Uh, but, you know, I'll just illustrate it here for uh, your reference, right? So then, uh, you know, you can replace this by inequality. 
So this is the first one is delta and x naught stays as it is and x is uh, so what is the bound on x if x minus x naught is less than x naught by 2 then the bound on x is 3x naught by 2 yeah yeah that's correct uh, is 3x naught by 2 so this is uh, 5x naught uh, by 2 delta which is less than epsilon uh, whenever yeah something like this uh, like uh, is that okay <clears throat> yes ma'am yes okay so is everybody with me up till this point yes ma'am okay uh, so the next part is so this shows that f is continuous on the interval uh, 0 to infinity however i claim that f is not uniformly continuous on the interval 0 to infinity yeah um, so you know having understood uh, what is the definition of f is continuous uh, and uh, what is the meaning of f is uniformly continuous can somebody you know sort of negate this statement for me and tell me what is that i need to do in order to show that f this given function in this example is not uniformly continuous on this set see all you have to do is just simply uh, simply negate this statement that i have written the definition of uniform continuity here um, Ma'am, from the last part, we have found that uh, for any arbitrary x naught, hmm. uh, delta is minimum of x naught by 2 and 2 epsilon by 5 x naught. Correct. So it depends both on x naught and epsilon. Hmm. So. Uh, we cannot use this argument. See, this what uh, your approach is telling us is that you give me an epsilon and there is a delta that serves to work the definition of continuity of f, right? This does not say that there is no uniform delta that will work for every x naught. You know, this is one delta that will work, but this does not say, saying that f is uniformly continuous is something very, very strong. It says that no matter what you do, you cannot choose a delta that will work simultaneously for all the points x naught and x. Okay. Uh, did you get my point? Ma'am, uh, here we are showing that for any arbitrary x naught, uh, okay, we need to choose a delta means this is for a particular case right no no all i'm trying to say is you have said that you know let's fix a point uh, x naught and let's let's do some analysis uh, let's fix epsilon then there is a delta depending on both x naught and epsilon such that something something happens right now this this statement alone you know uh, so let's just go back to the definition of yeah so if you look at the definition of f is continuous on this set right you know what is that we did we demonstrated a delta here which depends on both x naught and epsilon now having done this you know we just can't say that look here this delta depends both on x naught and epsilon hence we cannot choose a delta which is independent of x naught and we are done we cannot do that this particular delta that you chose depends on x naught by epsilon but for example uh, you know some friend of yours you know, somebody, you know, some student B can find me another delta star, which is independent of X naught. 
and you know which depends only on epsilon and that satisfies this that whenever x and x not are in delta neighborhood of each other then f of x r and f of x not are in epsilon neighborhood of f of x not yes ma'am got it yeah see the point i'm trying to emphasize is there is no uniqueness to delta saying that one delta which depends both on x not and epsilon does not rule out the possibility of saying that you know there might be another delta star which is independent of uh, x not that will do the same job so if you have to prove that f is uniformly continuous that is much stronger than this yes is that okay yes ma'am Yeah, so if you have to prove that f is uniformly continuous, sorry, f is not uniformly continuous, you have to do the following. Yeah, you have to show that there exists an epsilon not positive such that for every delta positive, there are points x not and x in the set E such that you know this this inequality does not hold true whenever x and x not are in delta. X not uh, x square minus x not square is at least as big as epsilon not. So what is that I'm trying to show? That there exists a del epsilon not positive such that there is no positive delta which depends, uh, which works simultaneously for all the points on the set E. what you have shown is that there exists a delta which depends on x not and epsilon and it works but it doesn't say that there cannot be something else which is independent of x not and does the same job that is not shown here is that okay you know this is very very important to realize what is to be done uh, you know uh, yes, did i drive my point home does everybody you know is everybody with me on this so ma'am we have to show uh, find an uh, find an x uh, so i i'll just write down yeah uh, maybe this is just too much to process orally uh, i'll just write down oh where am i sorry uh, i was here no uh, let me just add a page here uh, give me a minute ah huh? so uh, we will just follow the definition of uniform continuity so saying that f is not uniformly continuous means that you need to find an epsilon not positive such that no matter what delta you work with there is a point x not in the interval 0 to infinity and x in the interval 0 to infinity such that <clears throat> so corresponding to this epsilon not there is no universal delta that will work so you choose epsilon you fix epsilon not first and show that no positive delta will work theorem that on a compact metric space we mm. can always say that it will be uniformly continuous correct correct so ma'am for this case like for this uh, example particular example x square if mm. i consider 0 1 closed interval then it will be uniformly continuous correct correct yeah that's true so it will be uniformly continuous on the compact set 0 1 closed and bounded interval however yes. on this set it's not going to be uniformly continuous 
So, ma'am, like now, I, now, I, now I want to extend this. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I want to change my compact metric space to zero two, and like mm -hmm. proceed in this manner. Then I can always do that. Like, I can always consider a very large number, which is so of see, zero. So, so you're saying, you know, zero one, it is uniformly continuous. Now zero two, it is. Now yes. zero three, it is. Yeah, and now and you're now. saying zero to, you know, ten to power, you know, one billion, it is. Yes, and then what do you do? So, ma'am, like it will always be. I can always say that it will be uniformly continuous. See, it doesn't this. work like that. That's what I'm trying to highlight. You know, when you choose zero one, when you speak, saying that f is uniformly continuous on zero one, all it means is you fix an epsilon, and then there is a delta depending on epsilon, such that for every x naught and x in the interval zero one. Something happens, you know, when x lives in x naught delta neighborhood of x naught, then f of x lives in epsilon neighborhood of x naught. Now, when you say f of x, f is uniformly continuous in the interval zero to two, then you know again the same thing. Fix epsilon positive, then there is a delta depending on epsilon possibly, such that for every x naught and x uh, in the interval zero to two. <coughs> You know the same thing happen. Now, if you have to show uniform continuity on the interval zero to infinity, you have to show that let epsilon be positive, then there is a delta such that for all x naught and x in the interval zero to infinity, the same thing holds. But that cannot be done. See, yes, saying that you know in this case, you let's say you get a delta one here that works. So you fix a positive epsilon. Yeah. There is a delta one here that uh, you know gives you guarantees uniform continuity in the first case. There's a delta two here. There is a delta three here. If you want to you know use these delta i's to work for the interval zero to infinity, yes, yes. Tell me. Yeah, somebody want to say something? No, ma'am. No one saying anything. No, okay. Sorry. Sorry. So you know, if you want to sort of use these, you know, this delta i's to get to, uh, you know, get a delta that will work for the interval zero to infinity, what is that you have to do? You have to, you know, you have to choose delta to be the minimum. In this case, you know, there are infinitely many of them. Infimum of these delta i's. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Now it is very well possible that the infimum of these delta i's is zero. You know, for example, you know, delta i can be one upon i. Yes, right? The infimum is zero, but you you know you should be able to get hold of a positive delta. Yes, ma'am. How does compactness help us? Compactness helps. You know, you know, why do we have uniform continuity on a compact set? If you go back to the proof, this is what exactly is being used. You know, compactness guarantees that instead of taking these infimum of infinitely many i's, infinitely many indices i's, compactness ensures that you can just work with finitely many deltas, and you know you can take the infimum there. So in you know in you know minimum of finitely many positive number is going to be a positive number, and then you get a delta. However, you cannot replicate the same procedure here. Is that okay? So, yes. Uh, Aman, maybe, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, Aman, is that uh, you who was asking this question? Yes, ma'am. I understand. Yeah. Now. So I now you follow this. Yeah. You know, you yes. cannot. You know, just say that. You know, just because it is uniformly continuous. You know, on zero to ten billion, or you know, whatever your favorite number, that will guarantee that it is uniform continuous on zero. It may still be. You know, in some cases, but in this example, it's not. Is yes, all I'm trying to say. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. You know, so uh, you know, in order to just finish this article, somebody help my yes. Find out. Suggesting something, so let's uh, let's see. So Aman's approach. Uh, so let's take uh, epsilon not to be one. He says that maybe this will work. Okay. And now what is that you show? You have to show that 
corresponding to epsilon not equal to 1 no positive delta would work right so you know for every delta positive yeah so i'll, I'll just say that uh, choose delta positive and now how do you choose points x not and x those need to be chosen carefully right Ma'am, choose x not to be one by delta and x to be de delta by two plus x not. Just a minute, ah, huh? I'll just write down. What is that you're saying? Please say that again. Uh, x not to be one by delta. X not to be one by delta and x to be delta by two plus x not. Okay. So why do we choose these points x not and x? How does the idea come from? This may perhaps yeah. work. Uh, because x minus x not. This comes is, from like we consider uh, x minus. F. Sorry. Uh, this comes from f x minus f not. Then it will be x square minus x not square. Then x minus x not uh, mod x plus x not mod. Uh, after that, x minus y is already less than. Uh, no, no, I understand all of that, but uh, I am just trying to think aloud here. That why should one look at x not as the reciprocal of delta in the first place? Uh, you know, uh, so there should be some hint somewhere, right? Um, yeah. So uh, you know, if we go back to the uh, way we have chosen delta here, you know, uh, so delta in this example is you know, uh, so minimum of two epsilon by five x naught. Yeah. So when x naught is large, delta is very small. It means that when delta is large, x naught is very small. So maybe, so how did you think of uh, these points x naught uh, like this, Aman? Uh, could you sort of uh, illuminate us all? So that, you know, we sort of think logically. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so like, ma'am. You know, how should one go about thinking these things? Um, my x minus x naught should be uh, very le less than delta, first of all. So Correct. in this case, x I consider my x minus x naught to be delta by two because delta by two is always less than delta. Excellent. That was my first choice. Right. For this. So one way to do it is you know you choose x to be delta by two plus x naught. That is a good way, right? Now you have to search fix the point x naught, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. So then how do you choose x naught to be one by delta? Um, ma'am, we now we have to consider x plus x naught. So my x plus x naught would be because I chose this. No, no, I, I sort of I fully agree that this possibly might work. Let's just check uh, check this. But uh, x square minus x naught square is uh, you know by your choice it is uh, one by delta plus delta by two square. Uh, minus one by delta square, right? So this is uh, one by delta square plus delta square by four plus two one by delta uh, times delta by two minus one by delta square, right? So what remains is uh, delta. Yeah. So you know there's a term one that remains, so that works. So this is always bigger than one side. Right? So your uh, your yeah yeah your, so your calculation is right, but I'm just sort of trying to uh, think as to why one should take uh, x naught as one by delta. So if you're convinced, then excellent. You know I don't have to say anything. Okay, so I think I'll just uh, stop right here. Uh, I have already overshot time, and uh, if uh, Niladri is around, then I can sort of uh, take up. Uh, uh, what he wanted to say.